that one and you can dominate the early game of Sky Temple and have a crushing win. Back to back, both these maps are the map picks of Blossom. Where you have this small lead and you snowball it because that's how Chris Paul can work if done correctly. And you go into Sky Temple, which works very similarly. Suddenly you have this 2-0 lead. Your opponent got crushed in both games. It wasn't a close game, it wasn't even a long game. And that's when you're like, okay, this is a problem. Raven might, you know, start to feel a little bit demotivated. Crazy stuff can happen. You can do weird picks or just not play up to their normal standard. I think that's why we see the Sky Temple map pick after a crushing win so often in this tournament. It's all about the mentality of the players and the atmos atmosphere. It connects to the atmosphere of the team. We see it all the time in real sports also. And Korean commentators also, the players, they talk a lot about the mentality of each player and the team. So that's where we, that's where we get this story from. And let's go into Sky Temple. It is game two. Raven really needs to step this up as if they lose this 2-0, they're going to have a hard time during the break. Definitely true. Bala, uh, pick, the highlight pick here. It looks like they want to remove that. Giving some respect to Dudu. And we saw the Zeratul pick hovered just briefly there, but they let it go through. Bossum may actually ban it themselves here. They did it in the previous set. Not want to play against that. Wily Dark Templar. It's very wily, Zeratul. He also wears a bandana, even though he doesn't have a mouth. What's up with that? What's up with that? He wants to hide it. Come on. He doesn't have one. He doesn't that, have a mouth. That, maybe he does. Why... Maybe he's the only. Maybe he's the only Templar that has a mouth, and that he. Well, that's why he wears a bandana. Weird. Zeratul's a strange guy. He looks cool. Come on. I love Look him. at the bandana. It's so, it's so long. <laughs> What's he hiding? It's like it's like it serves as a bandana and a loincloth. It's called fashion. Wolf. I'll try to understand the, the 2017 fashion, okay? All right, but <laughs> what kind of bandana serves as a bandana and a loincloth? I'm just I'm wondering about that. Okay, Zero Two is banned. Maybe that's why he's banned. No, not. Let's go. Let's get serious, Ben. Too fashionable. Yes. So Raven will have first pick here. Let's see what they want to go with. They went with a false stat last time. And uh, it wasn't the, the world's greatest false stat. He did get picked early on by Wiz, which was kind of an issue. Um, it was Hamlin on the false side in the previous set. And that affected the early game. I don't feel like it was the world's worst false side or anything like that, but it did not get the value for them that they were hoping it would. And they did that super early gust on the boss, didn't hold it. And they're going to go with the Malfurion instead. Yep. Uh, standard picks, safe pick, one of the safest pick for first pick, of course. And, but this actually gives Blossom lots of other options. They also have Zarya Testar available again. We saw some crazy Illidan comments you mentioned yesterday. Well, you and I have talked about Wiz as a shot caller and how, as a shot caller, if you were the solo laner, you have a lot of time to look at the minimap, see rotations, see the state of the game, as long as you're being fed information, and then just kind of control the game as a shot caller in that way. And so they may decide, because of the way Dahaka works as a solo laner versus how Falstad works as a solo laner on this map, or a split soak, they may decide to have the Haka here over the Falstad. They're going to take both, actually. But I was going to say, you know, I feel like Blossom does not need to take the Falstad over the Dahaka. In this case, on Sky Temple, they would even be potentially willing to give it away. They take both, so it's definitely going to be Wiz on the Dahaka. But now Raven doesn't have any source of globals unless they grab ETC right now. ETC, or we saw a crazy Zagara network game coming out from Tempest that's also a global if you can really deal with that macro fight. I just don't feel like you can run it against the Dahaka and the Falstad. You'll we'll never have room tough. to do anything. Yes. So I expect that this is going to be a global less game from Raven. We're and also having Malfurion, you, you can you already have so much more CC to connect. Have a CC chain into a target like Falstad would be the best. So just picking up ETC before the bend phase, I think Raven can Build a solid CC comp for team fight. Material and is it gonna be Sergeant Hammer? So just going into a solid comp here. The serial can give them a little bit more boss control. Obviously can protect the Sergeant Hammer in a good team fight, but that's not the pairing that they're always looking for. With Malfan's hammer and also a very strong siege power. 
and push the bottom lane. You can think about the later stages of the temple when the bottom temple spawns. That's high when you need the fountains right next to you, and when you don't have the fountain, it's going to be hard to sustain. And also, when you have Valkyrian on the other side, that's going to be quite troublesome for Blossom for sure. You know, with the advent of globals, though, it's funny how. Very, like, it's insanely rare nowadays to see the fountain killed, even though that was, like, the go-to strategy, especially in Korea for a long time. With all the globals now, if you actually commit to that, you get up, end up getting outpushed and bought in mid, usually, and you lose control of the Merc. So it's kind of funny how, uh, even though we talk about that a lot, it almost never ends up being the case. And I think with the Dahaka and the Falstad, they probably won't end up on the fountain. But it's actually a good point that you bring up, because it does empower that type of play, which I think may eventually see a comeback. Tastar gets banned here, so they are just afraid of dealing with a Tastar in a melee coming in with a solo ranged hammer, like an Illidan, or uh, potentially like a uh, Thrall. That's right, Ren. Blossom. With that Tastar ban, I think the Raven is less likely to pick some me melee like Greymane, to have Sank connection. They have that burst along with the pokes coming out from Hammer from the back line. Already having two globals now onto Blossom for the double pick. Yep, they are looking for probably a main tank and a support, and they'll save their last pick for Flex. Would likely be the Karzim and a Muradin, I have to guess. And that's really kind of about it, right? Like, if they want to get DPS now, that's acceptable, but. I think you'd rather wait to see. You could also save the tank for the last pick and pick your DPS now if you want to go into the Arthas as a closer. For example, instead of the Muradin, that's something that you could save for the last pick to respond to the last picks of Raven. And that's how they're going to do it. They're going to save that pick for last, and they're going to take the Leaving and the Karazim. And now, Raven, are they going to bring in the Grey Main that you mentioned? I think that would be a wise choice. They don't have the Tastar to support it. And we'll see. With Tyrael, they have the Sank Mosh collection that's available, and they do need a secondary tank or the main tank. So I think ETC with Tyrael should do the job for Raven. Hammer can poke from the poke from the back and Grey Main, or I think we're going to see something strange. I have this feeling. Well, it's Raven, so. I mean. You really want to run an Artanis here? I hope not, for Raven's sake. They've been most successful with it on Dragonshire. We're not going to have that much interaction with uh, our big beefy Templar here. They're holding it to the last second. And it's going to be ETC with the Grey Main. There's the Grey Main. ETC for Global. Grey Main for Tyrael. Also has the global potential. That's right. So I think this is an Arthas pick now. Lock up all everybody in the CCs. Already have the double global. Arthas can deal with uh, the Tyrael and Greymane very well. Muradin has the ability to really rotate really well around the bot temple very specifically and can deal with the watchtower and temple interaction very well with his dwarf toss. We've seen a lot of that in terms of escapes and uh, engages. Johanna. I guess this does counter both the Grey Main and Hammer damage. She just was off my mind. So we don't even usually see her as a counter uh, in the meta, even when she could be considered one so directly, like in this case. Johanna can also blind all the auto attacks from Sergeant Hammer and get some and soak, soak up some damage in the front line and also stand on that shrine for a long time by herself. So here we go. Between Raven and Blossom. If Blossom is able to take game number two. They will have a very good streak before they go into the break. Let's see if Blossom can bring us to a 2 0. Oh, oh, Raven will catch them up to 1 1. In blue, Team Raven, Joju on Malfurion, and Hamlin on ETC and MX on Sergeant Hammer, Dion on Terriel and H82 on Greymane. 
In red, Blossom, Scarlet on Karazim, Dudu on Lee Ming, Wiz on Dehaka, Judy on Johanna, and No Chet on Falstad. Johanna the Crusader has made an appearance in this game. We're going to send Dehaka to the Watchtower. And Raven is going to split off. Having Sergeant Hammer actually going bot. Might get invaded. This is kind of funny how this is working out. Wiz again going to be the solo defender. With his tongue, though, he could actually grab HA2. He's taking a ton of damage. Raven does have that base armor in Worgen form, but... We'll get away. He's got the sustain. It looks like it's going to be kind of a lane swap, actually, for Raven. This lane swap is really powerful against a, you know, a really good wave clear soul laner like a Tahaka because you kind of say, oh, well, you just don't get value in the soul lane right now. Oh, you already used your global? Well, that's too bad because now you can't leave and you're stuck up here. So we don't see this kind of tactic very often, but it's really cool when you do see it. And then they have down here decent uh, defense with the ETC who can threaten a big hefty commitment and the Sergeant Hammer that can poke out almost anything. So this lane swap works well for Raven. And they get slightly ahead, I would argue, as a result. I think this is a very smart move from Raven to have this lane swapped on top. As both, both teams were trying to commit a little bit more to pushing before the minions come, but they distributed almost perfectly so that they soak up all the EXP and not miss a thing. Also to respond perfectly to each other. First temple phase has started. Maybe Sergeant Hammer actually down here against No Chat in this quote unquote soul lane. Ooh, NMX I think could have actually gotten the kill had he autoed first before doing that. No Chat will escape. It's actually gonna be neutral temples for the time being. Actually Dahaka rotates mid. Don't deal with that wave push. With a double global, it's easy to kind of mitigate the extra lead in the lane push that Raven had early on. So, you can see that they're actually starting to take an EXP lead now. So this shrine phase will conclude, it looks like, with an exact dead even split between the two. All five shots for each temple. It was important for Raven to take all those shots before Blossom could finish the top temple because they have Blossom has false that they have the hack that they can join the team fight and try to invade the middle temple if Raven was slower just by a little bit, even getting the last five shots, which is very important to snowball. It is well done by Raven. This is already looking so much better with this trap. Yeah, definitely would agree with you. They had a really strong strategy for the map as well. Blossom's pick, and they respond well. So, ooh, that could have been a nice route on the no chat. It's not like he had vision. He's hiding in the bush. This is a really strong push, though. Blossom needs to respond. I mean, this is double Siege Giants, Sergeant Hammer. Siege Giants and a Siege Tank, okay? Joju's got decent wave push with his uh, Moonfire as well, as you can see here. Didn't get the chance to heal the Siege Giants. That would have been also one of the reasons why Malfurion is really strong in situations like this. Blossom has this top push because Raven did not get the Merc camp. And De Jong is just going to try to shield this minion wave to help out. He's actually going to lose this fort if, no, if nothing else changes, though. It looks like they will get the lesser of the exchange in terms of direct damage. It's going to be almost a whole fort for just really some damage done to the wall in the bot lane. Raven, I like the fact that Raven is really taking this careful approach every every single turn they know they have a lot of presence, presence to pressure and nmx staying safe is not really going out too far getting some pokes down from doo-doo but that's just going to be it no kills all they have to do is just keep this wall get some pokes done but just maintain the wall and the fort safe healthy until the next temple phase happens a lot better protection actually on the Siege Giants here for Blossom than what we saw from Raven. And I think kind of getting uh, countered a little bit by the response for Blossom. And again, Blossom takes this big lead in terms of structural damage. Wiz actually has to deal with the later bruisers though before he can rotate down. So there's going to be a slight delay before he can actually use his global uh, brush stock. And also, he did not get the top 40. He was very close to doing it, but the bruisers actually prevent that. So Raven will actually very briefly hold control of this temple. So it looks like we're going to see uh, Balstead fly home before flying in. So they're going to get a lot done here, actually. I don't think Blossom even has to contest for this. 
now that now that false then ha has boomer boomerang and after seven has the wave clear they can push both lanes instead and it's not pressure just keep the pressure on for the bottom lane but also soak up both of the other lanes to catch up the exp and hit 10 before raven does and try to have a team fight after it's definitely what they decided when you see the false dead go back to hearth home they, you know that's when they're not even going to try to contest this is really aggressive by Raven. They're losing a lot of uh, structural damage and lane push by committing a four, actually a five man. It wasn't even a four, it was a five man gank. Didn't hit anybody with power side, didn't actually touch anybody. And so now Blossom gets the whole fort down. He's getting free soak and bot. There's a Lee Ming down there, so it's not threatening, but he's gonna get them 10 first, exactly as you just said. It's only slightly. I mean, it's going to be dead even, but Raven, I feel, could have been further ahead. Yeah, but even giving up the entire tempo, they've caught up EXP by soaking the other two lanes. That's one of the tactics. You can give up the tempo. It's a very strong objective, of course. Give you lots of shots, but hold on to that thought. We're going to see a fly-in coming up from the from Falstad. Hamlin gets very low, so he's forced to go back. And there's a drag onto Malfurion. Perfect sank to finish, finish off the target. Oh, no kills yet, just yet. Palm is ignored. That was a great, great sanctification. Oh my god. That is a wipe if that sanct doesn't go off. I mean, all five of them are dead. They almost turned the fight around because it was a really nice Twilight Dream after the sanctification. And the Gust was the reason why Blossom was able to survive that exchange without losing anybody. It's actually crazy to even think that either team would try to boss right now, especially Blossom. They used way more heroics on that exchange than Raven did. Raven actually still has Mosh Pit and Go for the Throat. Okay, they're not going to contest the boss, and we're going to reset back to an almost dead even point. Blossom is going to have this bot push because they got both camps. That last fight was over the first camp, the second camp now going to be taken. So Sergeant Hammer going to have her work cut out for her to defend the bot push. As uh, that bot fort is actually pretty, pretty heavily damaged. That's the one real advantage Blossom has in this game. EXP is still dead even right now. Now that they have fought each other at Admitted that you guys are both, oh, you guys have pretty decent team comp. That was a pretty good team fight. And then now this is where Blossom will take the control. They have Falstad standing on the bottom. And Sergeant Hammer seems like he was, she was trying to stall some time, but decides to join the team fight. And they're soaking Tempo at the bottom and EXP from the top. Even the camp is pushing. All they have to do is pressure a little bit so that Raven takes a longer time to take the middle tempo. Yep, and that's exactly what's working out for them so far. Wiz is just waiting for the right moment to brush off Granny. He's going to try to even get a, one more wave. As they actually walk off the temple, which further delays it. In just a moment, Falstaff will be ready to fly in. All heroics are available this time, including the very important Blessed Shield, which can really help initiate. It can also interrupt a mosh pit. Okay, this is actually... Uh, a lot of resources spent for Johanna, who can literally just cleanse herself and walk away. It's actually on cooldown right now. Look at that, the Blessed Shield coming in. Good cleanse here onto Hamlin. There's so many cooldowns used on Johanna there. Another good Sank. I don't know if it's good enough, though. This is canceled on the Sank, but there is a Twilight Dream. Ooh, NMX doing a ton of damage right now. Judy's actually very low. Great Palm, though. Will he turn this around? He's going to try to. Instant wave, of course. And Mosh was cancelled right in the middle, so basically all the heroics used. Now it's all about the skill shots. Let's go right in. De Jong is taking, soaking in some damage. There's a great borrow to stall some time. There's already two kills going for Blossom. All right. Now Blossom hits 13. Look at the top push. Look at the bot push. And I think a lot of that fight could have been way better for Raven, especially with that amazing sank. Had they not wasted Root uh, and that power slide on Johanna very early on because they couldn't actually start the fight with either of those CCs. And they were just trying to pick Johanna off. And if you've ever played against Johanna or played as jo Johanna in Hero League, you'll know that this is just never what you want to do if you can avoid it, especially uh, if you know Iron Skin is available. This boss take here, there's nothing that Raven could do about it. They scout it way too late. The cutest part is the scouting drone. It's like, oh yeah, let me check one more time. Yeah, they got it. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, they're not going to be too aggressive taking this invade. Actually, they are. looks like they are just giving up on Raven yeah. as they do not see the Hakka at the moment. And this boss is pushing, so if they it, need more time. Exactly. If they tried to contest and it took them a long time, the boss would do even more damage. So it'd be, the boss would do more damage than the Siege Giants would even do for Blossom, so it's just better to let it go. 
as uh, anyone who's watched Frozen will tell you. Now, 15 to 13 for Blossom, but the key is really the lane pressure as this next temple phase is coming up. This hasn't even been dealt with yet. Blossom is going to have a free setup to take the temple. Actually, looks like they want to take this giant cap once more before, so they're going to have that pushing. Someone's going to have to deal with that as they come in as five. Wiz actually doesn't even have to brush stock in. No chat looking for a gust. They have all her old ten rogues are available. Mosh pit's still uh, usable here. Now this is looking so much better for Raven. With one temple, they have this position, and they're going to look for uh, coming in. And they have gust available on the side. Falstad is looking for that gust. They actually did a lot of damage to No Chat, so it's going to be hard for him to engage. This is not looking too good for Blossom for the start of things. Cedera Elixir is done now as well for this next fight. So here we go. Judy up at the front, has already used Iron Skin. And No Chat once again taking a lot of damage. Oh, and the Elixir damage is crazy! Down he goes. And this is going to be a one temple for Raven. The bot push is pretty devastating, as you guys can see, but still a lot of damage done into the mid-keep wall by Raven with this temple. Even soak up some EXP on top as Serial will later on go to the top. And with that temple, even though the camp is pushing on the bot, they've caught up some EXP, and the temple phase is just over, so they can also soak up some so much EXP. Just trying to catch up on the EXP to hit 16 corresponding to the Globals of Blossom. I'm just looking at the map right now, it's almost completely painted red. You can see that uh, objective control is always for Blossom so far. This is the first time Raven has really had a nice opportunity. Once again, it's the Johanna that all these cooldowns are blown on to. They have a little bit more time to have those refreshed this time than the last time. Wiz is coming in, though, before that can happen. Trying to body block De Young. We do see the Sanctification is used. Some really nice Sanctifications this game. And a good gust here from No Chat to stop the engage. Things are going to reset. This game is anyone's to take right now. And this has been really close. There's one good mosh onto Leeming. Leeming and Johanna. I think that's going to catch almost everyone that can stop. Mosh pit easily from Blossom's side. So it will most likely to be with all ETC. Hamlin has a lot on its shoulders here. This is super aggressive by Raven. Gust is up at 20. They know it's not ready yet. Had it been, this would have been really risky. Judy's gonna run in here, go for the big condemn. Gets holy grounded outside. Has to use Iron Skip, but still takes a ton of damage while doing so. Gets back inside. Bossman just trying to buy time. Blessed Shield is up. And five seconds until Gust is ready. Dahaka split soaking bot currently. It could actually invade this top temple. He's got a huge wave pushing bot, and he's going to just harass this and then eventually rotate top. This is such a uh, terrifying position if you're Raven because there's nothing you could do about Wiz. And you can't stop him on the bot, and you also can't stop him from coming up to the top. So you actually need to want to, you want to force him to come up, and it looks like they could do that. They get the kill onto Li Ming. Exactly he's not coming up they, now. This is exactly what they needed to do. Uh, they saw Falstead going down, and also Dehaka on the temple, at the bottom temple. So they needed a pick, and Li Ming stepped over the line a little bit, got caught by the parse light. It was a pick for sure. Now Raven, they have, as they have one more person to go around the map, they have the pressure off of the top temple. They, they're only going to have Tyrael on that end. Also try to soak some EXP they were missing from the Haka and Falstead on the other side. We'll get a keep here more than Raven will uh, be able to do if they actually invade. Looks like they might just let it go, so it's going to be a keep for a keep. They didn't have uh, anybody go over there and contest, which I think was, if we're speaking technically, and it's really easy for me to say this because I have the bird's eye view, they could have sent someone there to delay. They didn't have vision that Raven was sending everybody to stop this bot push, so that's why they decided not to do that because it would have been risky if, say, Dahaka just went in there alone with his next brush stock. The next objective here is going to be the boss. And for Blossom, this is a much bigger pick. If they get it, it goes directly to the core. If Raven gets it, it will only go to the keep, which actually has a fairly healthy keep wall, if I'm not mistaken. So that's uh, that's something that Raven does not want to allow to happen. They don't get as much value, but it just cannot let it be taken away from them. As No Chat is actually pushing the catapult lane so hard that catapult pressure isn't really uh, working against Blossom at this moment in time. 
Miz is actually going to clear this up right now. The power of two globals in situations like this is so immense. And, you know, for Raven, they have to eventually just five-man group, as we just saw. And, oh, boy, look at the damage here on the next one. A really good cleanse and also a great sank. They're going to try to turn this. No chat comes in. The gust right after the sank there. NMX is dead. Judy still lives here. She's going to live a little bit longer. The palm ignore was really nice. Not just an ignore, it was almost a no follow-up on damage onto Johanna there. As Raven is looking for their ride lives, Deong is trying to stall some time so the Grey Mane is safe. Well, I don't know if he's going to be safe, but I don't know if Raven's going to walk out with a win on this one. They are walking directly towards the open keep. They um, are going for the core, they don't even care. Actually, they're going to find H82 walking right next to them. Yeah, the only way he could have gotten out of here, which would have been luck, was if he went down and tried to hearth. <laughs> There's a triple dash. Yep, he Starley is comes in. dead. Down he goes. Last to fall here. Blossom will take game number two with flying colors. Very easy win uh, in the first game. A second one took them a lot longer, but the double globals was just too much for even in the end. They were forced to team fight in awkward situations. I feel like they made the right choice of when they decided to fight. Collapsing on the top temple, for example, realizing, okay, the globals are going to come up. We have to force them to come up or else we're going to lose on both fronts. That was a good fight. The last fight they took there felt forced because they were like, okay, well, they're out rotating us. They're going to have 20 first. We should just five man onto this keep and try to take it down. The decision making was good. The execution, however, and the team fighting was not as good. And Deong was trying.